This morning we're going to change that. Young people and older people alike, open your ears. Listen up. Be praying earnestly that the Lord will bring us all closer to Jesus. Amen. That's what it's all about. That's the theme in the Bible. That's what the Bible teaches. And I love that song. Jesus loves me. This I know. One of my favorite. So today, as we go into the Bible, we're going to answer the question, who is this man with the number 666? What does the Bible say? Because it's not, it's not what I say that matters, but it really matters what God says. Amen. So let's have an added word of prayer as we pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us. Lord, we thank you so much for this time together. We pray for the Holy Spirit to be here, to guide, lead us closer to you. Lord, we just praise you now as we study your word, and we thank you for your truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Racing. Let me tell you a little bit about my parents' racetrack, because it involves all you young folk. When I was a little boy, about, all oh, seven, eight years old. We got any seven, eight-year-olds here? Okay. I got to tell you this story. At our racetrack, before the men raced, the big boys, the children raced. And the children came out onto the racetrack, took their shoes off, took their socks off, and the young people got the flag. The green flag came down. And we raced around that racetrack. And the one that came in first always won a special prize, all right? And, uh, but you know, I never won that race. I wasn't as fast as those other boys, especially my sister. Girls can usually run faster than boys. And my sister would outrun all the boys and win the races. And, and, uh, but I want to talk about another race. Did you know that people, are racing toward receiving the mark of the beast and being lost. It's incredible to think that people would actually do that, would be running toward receiving the mark of the beast. Can you believe it? People receiving the mark 666. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of Revelation chapter 13. The book of Revelation, chapter 13, as we find our setting here in the Bible. Now, before we read these verses, let me finish the story about the racetrack. The children would race, and then the women would race race cars, and then after the women finished racing the race cars, then the men would come on and race. So they had three races, children racing by foot, and then the, the ladies, and then the men. And the women were always better racers than the men. Revelation 13, look with me at verse 16 and 17. Revelation 13, 16 and 17. The Bible says, He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Now let me ask you a question. How many people are involved in this verse? That's what it says. All. It says, and, and it says, he causeth all, both small and great. You're not excluded from this ordeal that's taking place here in Revelation 13. The only way we can keep from being a part of this group is that we make sure Jesus Christ is in our life. And our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So verse 17, Revelation 13, 17 that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, isn't this amazing? The Bible says you won't be able to buy or sell unless you're following the Antichrist. If you're following the Antichrist, then you can buy and sell. Well, I'm a believer in what the Bible says. The Bible says if we give our life to Jesus Christ and we seek first the kingdom of God, everything else shall be added to us. Our food, our clothing, God will take care of us. Amen? So I don't have to receive the mark of the beast in order to be taken care of. But I tell you what, 
In the outcome, we're going to be better off if we serve Jesus instead of the man with the number 666. Look at verse 18. It goes on. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a machine. It is the number of a card. It is the number of a social security number. Now, don't miss what it says. For it's the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six, 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 six. Now, this is interesting because there are many books written about this subject. And these books have written and said that it's going to be a card. It's going to be a machine over in Belgium called the Beast which is a huge, or at one time, was a huge, huge computer. And so you got all these teachings that are going around that it's going to be a card, it's going to be a machine, it's going to be a number uh, that's Social Security number, and on and on and on. Now, it's kind of interesting because as I travel all over the world sharing the gospel, I get some very interesting letters from people. And I want you to see uh, some of the letters and some of the papers that I have received. This one here came through the mail one time to me. And this goes back a few years. It's kind of dated. So you'll understand what I'm saying when I read this. Someone sent this to me. And they said, the world goes on numbers. And I ran this from a computer. And they go on to say, this is the Antichrist. Henry Kissinger. You remember that? All the... All the info back in the day when they blamed Henry Kissinger for this and that. They said he was the Antichrist. Well, we know that's not true. Now, how do I know that it's not true that Henry Kissinger is not the Antichrist? Well, number one is his name may come out to 666, but he does not fit all the other identifying points. He has to fit all the points. Now, I used to do something very interesting in my meetings. And young people, this is something maybe your, your teachers can do with you, which is kind of, it's a little fun, but I don't want you to get scared if, it, uh, if the number comes out wrong. But you can take your name, your first, middle, and last name, and look, put the letters on a piece of paper, and then look at Roman numerals, because you have to do it in Roman numerals, and see what each letter, the number, what that letter represents. It'd be zero or it will be a number, depending on the Roman numerals, and see what it comes out to. Now, I used to do this on a board. I'd put a board up front when I would share this, and I'd have people to give me their name, and I'd write it down on the board, and then we'd calculate it and see what their name equaled. Well, I stopped doing that when one of the ladies' number came out to 666. <laughs> and she got very nervous and was ready to change her name, so I stopped doing that on a, on a board. You can do it at home, or you can do it at school, uh, but here's another one I got in the mail. This one came in the mail, and it says, you will take 666 if you use the barcode. Well, the interesting thing is everything has a barcode code today. And so this really, really doesn't fit. Uh, here's another one that I got in the mail, and it says, um, let's see which one. Oh, here's the one I'm going to share with you. It says 666 is here, and you have it if you have a Sears credit card. <laughs> well, the problem is I don't have a Sears credit card, so, so I'm totally okay with that one. And then I got this one from someone. Notice, very important, 666 if you have a Visa card. <laughs> well, I have a Visa card. And I thought, oh, no. So I took my Visa card, and I looked it over, up and down, and... Uh, I couldn't find 666. So I put it up at the mirror. You know, they say, if you put something at the mirror, you might see something there that you didn't just see looking at it. So I put it at the mirror and still didn't equal 666. So it didn't bother me very much. Until finally, not too many years ago, uh, I'm doing a lot of traveling and, and uh, I usually stay because they've done a, given me a really good deal to stay at the Hampton. And uh, Hampton Hilton kind of works together, you know, they're kind of together. So they sent me a card. And it's kind of interesting, the first three numbers on my card is 6, 
six, six. And so when I call in to make reservations and they ask me for my card number, I start off, I say, my number is six, 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 and I pause. And then you can hear them laughing in the background. I mean, you hear people just laughing because I've got that mark number. That doesn't mean a thing, does it? Doesn't mean a thing. The card is not the mark of the beast. It's not the number of on a card. The Bible says here it is the number of a man. Isn't that interesting? That the Lord reveals to us what this is all about. Now, look at verse 18. Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6, which is 666. Look at verse 8. Same chapter, Revelation 13, verse 8 says, All that dwell upon the earth. How many people? All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, the man with the number, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So here's the good news. The good news is you and I can get our name written in the Lamb's book of life. And if we have our name in the Lamb's book of life, even though we need to understand these prophecies, we don't have to worry about following the Antichrist because we have our eyes on Jesus. Amen? He's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. Last night in our seminar, we shared what the mark of the beast is. We also shared what God's mark is. And to really understand this today, we need to look at that again. Turn with me to Revelation 22, verse 4. Here's the Bible verse that tells us about God has a mark. Revelation 22, verse 4. And he says, they shall see his face. We're going to, we're going to see the face of Jesus, the face of God. They shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Now, isn't that interesting? Because we just read that the mark of the beast is going to be placed on the forehead. And so is the mark of God. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I don't want the mark of the beast. I want the mark of Jesus. I want his name in my forehead. So what is Jesus' name? Look with me at Revelation 19. Revelation 19 and here is the mark of Jesus, the mark of God. And it says this, verse 13, He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Jesus shed his blood for me and you. And his name is called what? The Word of God. Jesus is the Word. So if I want to have Jesus' name on my forehead, or in, as the Bible uses symbolisms, I want it in my mind, then I'm asking Jesus to write his word in my mind and in my heart. And when Jesus writes his word in our mind and our heart, then we're going to follow him. Now, hold your finger here on Revelation. Jump back just a few books of the Bible to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews and chapter 8. The book of Hebrews, chapter 8, and I'm going to read here Hebrews 8, verse 10. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10, and it says, Hebrews 8, 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their What's that next word? Mine. Forehead. And I will write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Listen, don't miss this. If you've got the law of God in your mind by itself, and it's not in the heart, then there's a real problem. So it has to come from the heart. Guys, listen to me. Especially the men, the women, you need to hear this too, but this is mainly for the men. What should every man do for his girlfriend or his wife on February the 14th? That's Valentine's Day. You give hearts, you give a box of candy, you give things 
that shows that you love that person. By the way, I'm going to be in Daytona at the race next month, February 14th, and in front of the racetrack, in front of the statue they have of Dale Earnhardt Sr., I'm going to be performing marriage renewals and weddings right there in front of the track. And so we've done that now for years and years on Valentine's Day. And the neat thing is this year it falls on Friday right before the race on Saturday night and Sunday. So it's kind of going to be a neat thing to show how we love each other and how we should care for our mate and so forth. But now let's look at something here. We have established what God's mark is. God's mark is his Ten Commandments. God's mark is he puts them in our heart and writes them in our mind. But what is the Antichrist mark? Hold your finger on Revelation again and turn with me to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel in the Old Testament and look with me at chapter 7. That's Daniel chapter 7. And here's what it says in verse 25. Daniel 7 verse 25. He shall speak great words against the Most High. Now this is talking about the Antichrist power. The Antichrist power is found in Daniel. It's found in Revelation. It's found in 2 Thessalonians. It's found in 1 Thessalonians. It's also mentioned in other books of the Bible. And here in Daniel chapter 7, it says he's going to speak great words against the Most High. Now we established what that mean, means the other night. The Bible says the Antichrist shall speak blasphemy. Do you know what blasphemy is? Is when a man claims the place of God. When a man claims that he deserves the worship that only God should receive. That's speaking blasphemy. All right, what else does he do? Verse 25 of chapter 7. He shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Another place says he will persecute God's people. And then this is the one I don't want you to miss. He will think to change times and laws. Now let me ask you something. Can you really, can anybody really change the word of God? No. 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 But the Bible says here he will think to. <laughs> he will think to change times and laws. Well, what does that mean, think to? He would attempt to change even the word of God. Now, here's what's interesting about the word of God. The word of God is solid. It's written, and you can't change it. You're not to add to it. You're not to take away from it. But throughout history, man attempted to change the Ten Commandments. And here's what he did. He says, I believe we should take the fourth commandment, which gives all the glory to God as creator, and change it because it says the seventh day is the Sabbath, and we need to change it to say the first day is the Sabbath. So when you read the Ten Commandments, the Bible says remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Work six days, but rest the seventh day. Now, I, I got to take you back a few years when I first became a Christian. My wife and I became Christians in the Methodist church. The Methodist church taught us about Jesus, that Jesus loves us, cares for us, and will save us. And so in the Methodist church, as I'm studying my Bible and teaching Sunday school, I'm sharing with the people what I'm learning from the Bible. And I was study, studying the Ten Commandments one day, and I, I looked at the first one, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The second one, Thou shalt not make unto thee graven images and bow down and worship them. The third one, Thou shalt not take God's name in vain. And I'm going through the Ten Commandments, and then I read the fourth one. It says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Work six days, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And I thought, now wait a minute. My preacher had just told me that Jesus resurrected 
on Sunday, the first day of the week. And I thought, here it says the seventh day is the Sabbath. So how could the seventh day be the first day? And it didn't make sense. So I looked up at a calendar hang, hanging on my wall, and I looked at the calendar, and the calendar, sure enough, just what the preacher said, Jesus resurrected on the first day of the week, Sunday. But then I started counting. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Saturday. And I thought, whoa, according to the calendar, the seventh day of the week was Saturday, not Sunday. And so I began to question these things, and I began to search the Scripture. So I thought, hey, I know you're not supposed to go outside of the Bible to explain the Bible, but I decided to do something. I looked up in the dictionary the word for Saturday and what it meant, and it said seventh day of the week. So I looked up the word Sunday, and the dictionary and encyclopedia said Sunday was the first day of the week. And then I was really confused because I thought, now oh, wait a minute, did somebody mess up the calendars or mess up the dictionaries or mess, mess this up or that up? And I realized it had not been mixed up that man had attempted to change even the law of God. Friends, let me ask you a question. Do we have any right in changing God's word? Do we have any right of taking away or adding to it? No. You can't change God's word. He knew what he was doing when he put the scriptures together through these men that he gave the Holy Spirit, inspired men of God. So when you look at the scriptures, what the scriptures say about this, you realize, hey, somebody's been messing with God's word. And nobody has a right to mess with God's words. I want you to think about something for a minute. The number 666 falls short of completeness. The complete and perfect number is the number 7. And it's used in the Bible from Genesis all the way through Revelation, the number 7 being the perfect number for God. And this is why the Antichrist has the number 666 because it's one short of completeness and it's the number of man and not the number for God. Wow. Second, the man with the number 666, he will ask for worship. <laughs> I should say it this way. He will command worship. Number three, Mr. 666 claims the place of God. And not only claims the place of God, but claims that those who are part of this man should receive prayers from the people. And that people should come to man to confess their sin instead of going directly to God. Friends, it's wrong to go to a preacher, a woman or man preacher, or any man, and pray to them and tell them your sins. We go directly to God through Jesus, and we ask it in Jesus' name, and we ask for forgiveness, and we are forgiven. Now, I had the privilege of being in the Philippines years ago over the Easter season. And here's what took place in the Philippines where I was that I had never seen in any other part of the world. On Friday, they actually took a real man, placed him on a cross, and nailed nails through his hands. A real person. Because this individual, as I watched them do this, this individual was told by the church that if he would be crucified and leave those nails in while they marched down the streets, that his all his sins were forgiven for one year. No matter what he did. 
And so they crucified him. It didn't kill him. I mean, he's got, you can actually have nails print going through your hands and so forth, and they use enough stuff to keep the infection and so forth. And, and you don't usually die. People that were crucified on the cross, the reason, the reason the Roman soldiers came by the crosses and broke the people's legs is because they knew they didn't die immediately from a crucifixion. And so that's why they broke their legs, so they couldn't crawl off and walk away. A gradual, a gradual death. And Jesus, when they came to Jesus, they found Jesus was dead. But to make sure, the Roman soldier took the spear and he put it right up under his heart. And the Bible says that blood and water flowed from his body. But he was dead. You know why Jesus died? Not because of the crucifixion, but because of a broken heart. Because Jesus had your sins and my sins placed upon him when he died on the cross. So man comes along. Mr. 666 changes every major doctrine or Bible teaching important to us. And the most important one is salvation. This is why so many people are messed up on salvation. The teaching of salvation by works is taught in almost every religion. Did you know that? They're told, religions are told that you must perform certain duties in order to be saved. Religions teach that if you've been divorced and remarried, even though you may not have been a Christian at the time, then you can't have an office in the church because you're a bad, bad sinner. Religions teach this. And that's not biblical. I want to tell you, when Jesus forgave me, he forgave me of all my sins. Amen? He cast them into the depths of the sea. Religion comes along and says, you've got to work at your salvation in order to be saved. The Bible says we invite Jesus into our life and we are forgiven and we are saved by the blood of the Lamb. So why do I keep commandments? Why do I do what the Bible says if I don't have to do something? I don't do it because I want to be saved. I do it because I am. I do it because I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so when I see people give their lives to Jesus, and if they really mean it, God's going to work through them and give them the power to be obedient. That's why the Bible says he will write his law in our hearts and in our mind. He will do it. <laughs> okay? You know, it's a natural tendency. This is humanity. This is the way humans are. We like to boast about what we can do. Hey, I've been good today. I, I didn't do anything wrong. Man, I was a good boy, good girl. I didn't fuss at anybody. I didn't scream at anybody. I'm just a good old boy. You get in the car and you drive down the street and somebody pulls out in front of you and you say a few naughty words. You know what I'm talking about? So we're not saved by some kind of good deeds that we come up with. We're saved by what Jesus did for us. And I want to share a little story with you here that happened not too many months ago. I, if I can get some help passing these out. Uh, now, I want to take these back up because I want to use the same illustration tonight. So everybody, everybody can, everybody, I'll do this side over here if you do back there. And uh, just hold it for me and look at it because I'm going to tell you a story about it, okay? All right. Can y'all share? That way we'll have enough here. And you share here. Oh, here you go, young lady. You get one there. Who didn't get one? You didn't? All right. Hold, hold it because I want these back so I can use them tonight, all right? Now, the reason I'm handing you this, look at this crazy looking machine. All right? I built this thing. It's 14 foot long. 
If you look at the motor, that is a Chevy V8 engine. Did you get one in here? I want you to see this. <laughs> You got a few more there? I just got a couple. Okay, that's all we need. And I want you to see this because as I tell this story to you, we built this thing several years ago, actually in 2005. This is called a trike. A few years ago, I should say, a few years ago. In 2005, it's 14 foot long. It's longer than a minivan. The front end that you're looking at there is a Harley Davidson front end. The motor is a Chevrolet V8 engine. The seat is a racing seat. The back seat holds two people. The rear end on this thing is a S10 Chevy rear end. The radiator is on the very back and it came out of a Ford truck. And there's things on the top at the very back to keep the air flowing so to keep it down on the ground. I know this thing will go 130. It's got 160 on the speedometer, all right? I took it out on a back road one day and I had it up to 130 and then it hit me. The guy that helped me weld this thing together had a drinking problem. And I started thinking if he was drinking the day that he welded this thing, I could be in trouble. So I've never since driven it at 130 again. I use it to take it to car shows, motorcycle shows. I keep a set of our books with me. And everywhere I go, people will come around this thing and say, what in the world is this? My wife used to ride with me on this, the back seat, till it got to the place so many people taking pictures that she became embarrassed. And she said, I don't like to ride it because they take too many pictures. And plus, it looks like the Beverly Hillbillies coming down the road. <laughs> now, I've been tempted to put a rocking chair on the back of that thing and weld it on some way that she could ride in the rocket. <laughs> no. So I, rode the, I ride this thing all over the place, all right? One day, the reason I want you to see the picture, one day I get a call from the hospice nurse. And the hospice nurse and chaplain had seen me riding on this thing through town. They said, Mr. Earnhardt, we've got something we want to ask if you would do for us. We've got a man who's under hospice care. His name is Larry. And Larry used to ride with the Hells Angels. Larry has not been able to ride a motorcycle for two years now. His last wish is to be able to ride on some type of motorcycle before he dies. And we saw you driving this thing around town and it looked like Larry could ride on that thing. And so I said, okay, I'd be glad to. When do you want me to do it? Today. Today? <laughs> you know, because we don't know how much longer Larry's going to live. It was a Tuesday. I said, okay, give me his address. They gave me the address. They met me at his house. I went to his house, brought, drove up on the trike. They helped Larry out on the porch. He saw this thing. He said, wow, oh man, this is great. Now Larry is so close to death that his skin is already turning yellow. Sick, sick man. I said, Larry, do you think you can sit on the back seat? Now, the back seat, I've got safety belts on the back seat. We helped Larry get up on that back seat, not fasten the safety belt. The hospice people left. They said, we'll call you later, see how things go. And so I rode Larry around town. I kept looking in my rearview mirror at Larry's face, and he had the biggest smile. I mean, he was, he was riding on a cycle. Not quite what he used to ride, but it was a sight. He was so happy. I remembered while I was riding him around town that on Tuesday afternoon at Firehouse Sub, these motorcycle groups come together and they eat there and they show off their motorcycles. So I decided to take Larry by there so he could see these other cycles. 
we drive up into the parking lot, and these guys and different gangs, different members of different motorcycle gangs all come over to help Larry get off the trike. So some of them remembered him as being one that rode motorcycles and rode with a gang. So they helped Larry off, and we went inside, and I bought Larry a sub, and we sat down there, and these guys come over and pat him on the back, you know, and, and tears just running down Larry's face. And Larry ate half his sandwich, and he talked with people as they came by. And Larry started feeling bad. And he told me, he said, you know, I, I probably need to go home. I don't feel good. And so the guys came. They helped me help Larry up on this trike and put the safety belt back on him. And I took him back to his house. Took the safety belt off, helped him get off the trike. We went inside. And he kind of fell back in his chair. He said, I just don't. And I said, Larry, I said, do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? And he said, I've been reading a few little books and things. And he said, I've just been so sick, I just don't feel like reading. I said, what if we invite Jesus into your life today? Would you do that? Oh, yes, please, please help me. And I said, you just repeat after me as I pray with you started praying and I said Lord Jesus and Larry repeated it after me Lord Jesus come into my life come into my life forgive me of all my sins forgive me of all my sins and that day Larry gave his life to Jesus after praying with him patting him on the back I walked out of his home and got on the tri trike and went back home the next morning early, I got a telephone call. Larry died that night. <clears throat> I'm going to see him again. Amen. Mm -hmm. Larry gave his life to Jesus Christ. And that's what salvation is all about. No matter who we are, no matter what we are, no matter what our background is, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Now, I know this morning I didn't go over everything I want to go over, explain the number and all of that, but it's in your little booklet. And if you can come back tonight, we're going to take more time with that and spend more time in, in identifying the man with the number. But the little booklet goes into detail, and it explains it all about this great uh, power that tries to take the place of Jesus Christ. You know, no one can take the place of Jesus. Amen. No one. He's the way. He's the truth. And he's the life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for your love, your mercies, your great plan of salvation. Lord, help us all to say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Help me get ready for your coming. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, young people. Yes, may I get these pictures back so I can...